All right, guys, this is going to be part one of intracranial regulation. So if you have your outline, just pull that out because what this piece is going to be is going to go over the basics of the neurological system, which is basically a review of your um, anatomy and physiology. So before we get into the nervous system itself, I want to talk about uh, the concept of intracranial regulation. Um, I put the definition on your outline, but if you really, if you break the word down when you think intra, you think inside, cranial being the head, the brain area. So we're inside the brain and we're going to try to regulate the processes that go on in there. And there's so much that you're going to learn as you move through the um, program about um, different uh, disease processes that can affect uh, the brain. But we're going to give you just the basic overview of the neurological system and the um, basics of intracranial regulation. So you, you know your neurological system overall helps to uh, regulate the majority of your bodily uh, functions. Uh, it controls your muscle movements, um, it controls your uh, senses, um, it controls your um, ability to think, to process things, um, as well as your emotions. So you collect different uh, sensory input and um, next week we'll talk about um, uh, part of the sensory lab, we'll look at some different sensory stimulations um, that you may experience. Um, and then it collects all of that, it processes it and interprets it, um, and then it causes responses throughout the body uh, based on what it has taken in. So I like to think of it as a switchboard, and I have a picture of that a little later on, um, because it, if you think back, which some of you may have to Google this to know what it is, but um, there was a point in time when we made phone calls that all went through a switchboard. Um, and you would just pick up the phone, you would tell the operator the number, the person you wanted to talk to, and then she would move wires and lines to get you connected to that person. Um, and that's basically what our uh, brain and our nervous system does. So um, as far as uh, just the average and regular uh, presentation of the nervous system, um, you have two principal parts, one being the central nervous system and one being the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system um, deals more with your cranial nerves um, and your spinal nerves. And then you also have the piece called the neuron, which is the basic cell uh, within the nervous system. Uh, this is covered by a myelin sheath. Um, which is just kind of a longer uh, and larger type of nerve um, and it helps with the speed of conduction of the impulses that we receive. So you'll learn about disease processes where there's damage to that myelin sheath. If that sheath becomes damaged and the uh, rate of the um, input being able to travel to the brain or from the uh, brain back to the body slows uh, significantly. And then you also have the white matter uh, of the nervous system which is the uh, material uh, within the brain. All right, so uh, we're going to look first at the central nervous system. A uh, big part of that being the brain itself. It is the uh, control center of the uh, neurological system and of the body uh, within itself. Um, it is protected by three different things, the first being the meninges, uh, which is connective tissue membranes that cover and protect. It also provides the nourishment for the central nervous system. The second being the cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF is how that is normally abbreviated. Um, it works to cushion um, the brain. It also helps to prevent injury. So it's kind of like a fluid sac that uh, forms around the brain to pr protect it. Um, but it also provides nourishment as well. And then the last piece being the skull, um, of which we all know is a very hard uh, bone that uh, surrounds the brain and it works to protect uh, the brain. All right, continuing on with the central nervous system, the second piece would be uh, the cerebrum. Uh, your cerebrum is um, the largest portion of the brain. The most outer uh, layer of the brain or the gray matter is your cerebral cortex. Um, the cerebrum is responsible for all of your conscious behavior and you can see it's divided into uh, four lobes um, and it's in two hemispheres. You've got the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain but these four lobes are on both sides of the brain. So we'll start with your frontal lobe um, and this is a picture straight from your book that kind of shows you what occurs within that section of the brain. Um, it controls your speech, your thoughts, uh, your emotions, a lot of your voluntary movement, your uh, judgment, your reasoning, um, your ability to have concern uh, for others. 
Um, so frontal lobe um, controls quite a bit of things and you'll notice that as you move over to the next one which is the parietal lobe speech is mentioned in there as well. Um, so some of these lobes kind of cover for each other um, so that you can hope that if one area is damaged that maybe the other area would pick up and cover a little bit. Um, your parietal lobe um, helps you uh, differentiate between different shapes. Um, it also helps to, to control your temperature, um, to know uh, pain, and to know the difference in temperature. So it uh, helps you to understand the difference between hot and cold. Then you have your occipital lobe, which is uh, what controls the vision. So you can see it sits back towards the uh, back portion of the brain. And then you have your temporal lobe, which uh, mainly deals with your memory um, and your ability to smell. The second uh, piece, um, you can see this is like the switchboard, uh, but the second piece we're going to talk about is the cerebellum. Um, it works with your muscle movement, uh, controls your balance, um, and your ability to control your body movements. Um, so it really works with that smooth skeletal muscle movement. Um, maintains your uh, equilibrium, which is your balance, and your muscle tone as well. Uh, the third piece is the diencephalon, and this was the piece that I really felt like um, is your main uh, switchboard. There's a, several different pieces within uh, the diencephalon, one being the thalamus. And this is where all input is processed. So this is kind of like the operator of the brain. All of your signals that you're getting from the rest of your body come into the brain through the diencephalon, through the, uh, the thalamus portion. It receives those signals, it determines where they need to go, and then sends them on to where they need to go. Uh, another portion of the diencephalon is the hypothalamus. It is the autonomic control center. And this is key because it influences activities such as blood pressure, um, heart rate, how strong of a heartbeat that you have, your digestive motility, your respiratory rate and depth, um, your perception of pain, um, your perception of fear. Um, it controls your body temperature. It controls your food intake, um, how much water you take in, and then your sleep cycles as well. So you can see a lot occurs within your uh, hypothalamus area. And hopefully you can see too by some of the things that I mentioned as to how some of these pieces and these overarching concepts that we're covering will start to tie in together and how they uh, kind of interrelate to each other. Then your third piece of the diencephalon is called the epithalamus. Um, it helps control your moods, your sleep cycles, um, and then it also uh, contains the piece called the uh, choroid plexus, which is where your cerebrospinal fluid um, is formed. Next we have our brain stem. Uh, your brain stem is uh, the basic uh, piece that controls um, our ability to function in our life itself. Um, so if your brain stem becomes damaged, um, then there's a very strong chance that you will not uh, live past that point. Um, it influences blood pressure by controlling vasodilation. It helps to regulate the respiratory rate and rhythm. Um, it's also responsible. Next time you develop hiccups, you can blame your brain stem. Um, if you develop a coughing spell or a sneezing spell, you can blame your brain stem. Um, it sits between the cerebrum and the spinal cord and it helps to connect those pathways from the higher structures that are located within the skull. With it, yeah, within the skull to the lower structures throughout the rest of the body. Then the last piece would be for the central nervous system would be your spinal cord. It's approximately 16 inches in length um, and it's a continuation of the medulla oblongata. Um, it passes through the skull at the foramen magnum um, and then it becomes a vertebral column uh, all the way down to the first uh, lumbar vertebrae. It's protected by uh, meninges, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, as well as your uh, bony vertebrae. It helps transmit impulses uh, to and from the brain. So not only does it send uh, impulses up to the brain, which is ascending, but it also sends impulses away from the brain, which is descending. Then you have your peripheral nervous system, um, your cranial nerves. There are 12 of them. Uh, you're going to become very, very familiar with them over the next week or so. They originate within the brain. Um, they serve different parts of the head and neck. Uh, the first two pair, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, originate in the anterior brain. And then the remaining ten pairs uh, originate within the brain stem. Uh, as we move further into this and we learn more about the cranial nerves, uh, you'll need to know the cranial nerve number, and that's always in a Roman numeral format. You need to learn the name of the cranial nerve. 
you need to learn whether or not it is a sensory nerve, a motor nerve, or if it has both capabilities. And then what activity it does, like how we test um, for that nerve. And part of that we'll learn once you get into the lab setting. Um, then you also have spinal nerves and uh, dermatones. There are 31 different pairs of uh, spinal nerves and they're named according to uh, where they uh, come out of the vertebra or about where they are. So you can see you have uh, eight cranial nerves, C1 through C8. Then you have uh, 12 thoracic nerves, T1 through T12, five lumbar nerves, L1 through L5, and then you have two, five sacral nerves, S1 through S5. Um, and then dermatomes are the areas of the skin that are um, innervated um, by the cutaneous branch of one spinal nerve. So all of your spinal nerves except for C1 serve some cutaneous region. So um, C1 is the only one that really does not have um, some type of dermatome. And then the last part of this is I want us to look at some of the developmental changes that occur um, between infants and older adults because those are usually the two biggest areas that we see the biggest changes within uh, the neurological system um, as far as part of normal growth and development. Um, in infants, uh, their growth is very rapid uh, during the fetal period. So as a newborn baby, there are several things, reflexes that they have as soon as they are born. Um, and then they begin to disappear after about one month of age. The first one being the sucking sensation. So if you rub um, part of their cheek or they automatically you stick something like your pinky within their mouth they automatically have that innate ability to, to suck on that pinky um, or you put a pacifier within their mouth they automatically know uh, what to do with that stepping if you ever hold a baby upright it's a little fetal move like it's trying uh, to walk rooting is where if you touch the side of their cheek they'll automatically turn their head towards that sensation uh, startle or moro reflex is where if you bump into their crib um, suddenly like all their arms and legs will just kind of flare out so, like they're startled. Babinski. Babinski um, is where if we uh, touch the bottom of their foot all their toes will kind of spread out like they um, um, they'll spread out. I can't think of what else I'm trying to say. Um, but Babinski is a positive, it's a good thing. We want to see that until they're about two years old. After the age of two if we um, stimulate the bottom of their foot their toes should curl in. If they do not, then that is an abnormal reflex. Um, so we will still check for Babinski and adults to see what their toes do. Do they curl in, which is abnormal? <clears throat> I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. As an adult, if we're checking for the Babinski response, if their toes curl in, that's normal. That is what we want to see. If their toes flare out, that is abnormal. Their toes should only flare out, which is a positive Babinski response, up until the age of two. After the age of two, their toes should curl in. Uh, their cry, their cry is, um, is, as I'm sure we have all heard, um, very strong. Um, we want to hear that strong uh, cry. We do not want it to be um, a very weak um, or more a more shrill, um, cat-like sound. Um, their head circumference, um, we typically measure that at the level of their ears across their forehead. You'll learn a lot more about that. Um, as you move into your uh, PEDS section. And then of course we always assess a child's fine and gross motor skills um, and then compare it against certain benchmarks and milestones so we can determine if a child is growing um, according to national standards. And then we flip over to our older adults um, and there's a lot of things that occur that are, are part of the normal aging process and these processes are very subtle, they're very slow, um, so it's very hard sometimes to see um, the decrease in their neurological function. Um, and a lot of times um, they have changes that we just attribute to, the, to their age, um, but a lot of these changes can also occur from different medications that they're on. They can occur with um, infections um, or illnesses, um, such as two biggest ones being Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. So just because you, um, you can see the list there, you have uh, your impulse transmission decreases, your reaction to stimuli decreases, your reflection, reflect, can't talk, your reflexes are diminished, um, the coordination is not as strong, their senses are not as acute, their muscle mass and tone uh, decreases. So we have to be careful and not just lump that into, oh well it's because they're old. There could be something else going on, um, like confusion. Confusion, we automatically chalk that up to us because they're old. 
Well, a lot of times, confusion is the first sign of an infection in an older adult patient. So those are some of the things that we have to uh, keep in mind when we're uh, looking at the older adult. All right, so that's it for this little section. Um, and like I said, it's just a basic review of your anatomy and physiology. So when we meet in class, you can see you've got way more of an outline, and we'll go over all of that in class and what all of that means. Um, if you want to go ahead and fill some things in from your book and from your reading, um, then that way you'll be able to listen more during class. That would be great. Um, but otherwise, just come to class with the outline, and we'll fill it out and talk about things there. All right, have a great evening.